we know intellectually, Father, that you came down in the form of a man named Jesus and you climbed upon a cross in love and you sacrificed who you are for the sins that we have created, that we've done, Father. Father, today I hope we get to experience your love in a way that it never will leave us and it will take us a little further down the road to getting nearer to you. Father, I'm dealing with your word and Father, your gospel message and Father, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Father, for it is the one that heals the men and the women of their sins and gives them eternal life. So Father, may we not add anything. May I not add one single thing to this, Father, only your word as I simply say what you want me to say. So Father, you have anointed, you have filled me, and Father, I, it's a hard time, it's difficult for me to say, Father, but you have favored me. And I know that, Father, but it just, it just makes me want to drop to my knees, Father, because there's nothing about it with me. It's all you. So, Father, it's your word, and I'm just talking with you. Of course, in the precious name of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, our Savior, <coughs> the Prince of Peace, that I pray, Jesus Christ, amen. We're going through Galatians, <coughs> southern part of Asia, that Paul, on his first missionary journey, took off to. Paul has a delicate mission. He is establishing the gospel message to the newly formed churches. There's one at Antioch, there's one at Jerusalem, and now the Holy Spirit, you can look in Acts 14 and 15 right in there. I mean, we've got a passage, but I'm not probably going to read that. That's a heads up from a PowerPoint person back there. Probably not going to read that part of it. It makes it longer. But the Holy Spirit has called Paul to go establish the gospel message to the Gentiles. And he establishes these churches. And no longer does he get back that there's already a problem going on. And Paul stands up and he is defending the gospel message. And I want to help us understand the gospel message in a way that we will defend it. And even in defending it, do it because we love our brothers and sisters. You see, see when the Great Commission was given, there was a message that said, go spread the word for I'm coming back. And there was an urgency that was there. And they rapidly started talking about the gospel of Christ in order that those that would be saved would be saved because they knew the returning of Christ was coming. I want us to put that urgency back in our hearts here now. I want us to go forth and I want us to boldly share the gospel. But I want us to do it in love. So when you do it in love, you're going to take a licking sometimes as you give the gospel message. But that's okay. Our Savior took it for us and we can take it for Him. I want to place an urgency in our heart. God has given you His Son, Jesus Christ, and has given you permission and a privilege to announce His Son to the world that they can have eternal life. We're in the eternal life process is what we're in. You hold the gospel message to give to your family members and your friends that will give them eternal life if they believe. Wow! Here's your Christmas gift. How about you live eternally with Christ Jesus? It's amazing, isn't it? We want to put this in a way that we truly understand it, for we're not ashamed of the gospel. You see, in the first five verses of Galatians, the Apostle Paul included the fundamental pillars of the gospel message in his opening greeting. And we saw several Sundays ago, he tells us this, number one, Galatians 1 4. He tells us that Christ gave Himself for our sins. Why? So that He might rescue us from this present evil age. You want to be rescued from the present evil age? Accept Christ as your Savior. You see, the Gospel is God's rescue operation. It's planned and delivered and it's freed believers from their sins, their condemnation, and a slavery that they have because of their bondage of sin. It frees them from their sin. Jesus Christ paid the full cost of this payment on the cross. It was done before you were born and you had nothing to do with it. He was loved on the cross, clearing your sin away in order that you now have access to the living God. You have access to the very one that's created you. 
Do you understand that? We have asked, he's up there, I guess I always point up there, he's everywhere, I guess I could just do this. We have access to the living God. No other religion except for Christianity has open access to the living God of the universe. They do not know their supposedly little G God. They try to figure it out. God says, don't figure this one out. I'm coming down in the form of a man. I'll show you who I am. And you're going to look at it that way. And then you're going to understand who I am by what I say. And we will follow Him. You see, because Jesus was both perfect man and perfect God, He completely fulfilled the law and the prophets and the proclamation. And the Father, Galatians 1.1, raised Him from the dead. Your Savior was raised from the dead. He overcame death. You see, the penalty of sin is death. Eternal damnation. The Gospel was at stake. The Gospel was being saturated with works. Paul says, no way. There's only one way. By each of us individually placing our faith in Christ, we received, listen to this, the unearned mercy of full payment for the sin as well as receiving unmerited grace for the victory over death through Christ's resurrection. You have been judged guilty. God has given you His mercy. And along with giving you His mercy, He gives you the grace to continue on in the path to glorify Him. Isn't that beautiful? He gives you the unmerited favor. I look at that like a child. My child is... My little... Our kids get bad sometimes, right? So <laughs> the child... It's supposedly done something wrong, but we give the child mercy, but we give the child grace enough to keep moving along that they can grow up. We give them the okay to move along. That's okay, let's keep going, that's okay. Jesus Christ has given you His grace to help complete what He's prepared for you beforehand should you walk with Him. Jesus Christ gave these precious worship team right here the mercy and the grace to sing those songs because if He didn't have the mercy and grace, they couldn't sing those songs. They wouldn't be deserving of it. Is that okay to say? Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Right here, if God would give me the mercy and the grace, I couldn't stand up here and preach His Word. It's only because of His favor that I am favored for Him. And I'm on the bottom of the triangle. I'm serving you. It's not like the corporations of the world. It's flipped upside down. Y'all are up here and we're serving you. And by serving you, you serve one another. Christ does it backwards. He came to serve and not be served. Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead, overcoming sin's grip on our life. That's the core of the simple gospel message. Paul ends his brief introduction but powerfully with a doxology. It's a short hymn on praise to God the Father in 1 5, and he says, To whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Here's the point of the first five. God has provided salvation through the finished work of His Son, Jesus Christ. The moment a person accepts Christ by simple faith that Christ died for her sins and rose from the grave, God declares that person righteous and rescues that person from this present evil age. You've been rescued from the present evil age if you accepted Christ as your Savior. In the ivory tower, we refer to this as the doctrine of justification. That's a pretty fancy word, isn't it? It's our new position in Christ, which is defined as a sovereign or independent act of God, whereby He declares a condemned sinner righteous. And it's the gospel of Christ that does that. No works of man, no schemes of men. It's something that's ordained by God. At the moment of our justification, or our being saved by grace through faith, our names are absolutely removed from the roads of hell, and now we're enlisted as a citizen of heaven. And by the way, it's never to be removed. Never to be removed because Jesus holds it. And He says, Father, what You have given me, I will lose none of them, and I will present them back to You. Oh, don't think you can lose your salvation. You didn't earn it. It's a gift. And God holds it. His precious Son, Jesus Christ, will deliver you to the Father at that special time. You see, this is what Paul is deferring to. Grace alone, through faith alone, through Christ alone. Solo fide, solo gratis, and solo Christus. 
faith alone, through Christ alone, through grace alone. Now we're going to move into the next five verses of the text. We're going to find Paul in somewhat of a dumbfound shock. He's just gone through the Asia Minor, and now he's back home. I can imagine, finally, I'm back home. I'm in a safe place. He had a good job. I'm reporting to all the people out here at the church in Antioch. We had a God had a great mission. We've established the churches. And lo and behold, he sits there dumbfounded. He's thinking, why in the world would someone want to work for their salvation when it's a gift from God? It was paid for. And now we come to the text, and here we go. In Galatians 1, 6 through 10. But you look at Paul. He's writing back to them after he hears the message that there's some people coming in and starting to distort the gospel message, the truth of what Jesus Christ told him of how to be saved. He says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ. It's a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, says Paul, are an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. And we have said before, and so I say now again, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. Verse 10, he says, For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? It's an important question to ask ourselves, isn't it? Are you seeking the favor of men? Are you seeking the favor of God? Look at John, Jesus is sitting. He's talked to some of the disciples that are there and some of the people. And he said, I will not give myself over to them for they want the what? The praise of men more than the praise of God. We have a tough time with that, don't we? We want people to like us. We want people to make sure that we're okay. Can I tell you that your position with Christ is so perfect that you need no one to love or like you. He's got enough love to like you in a way like you've never seen before. Therefore, you need to go out in a, what we call a foundation of understanding you are totally loved and you're able to speak the truth in love to everyone you come across. Debbie and I share our life together. We reach out to Christ for Him to teach us how to live with each other. Doing pretty good so far, right? We're still together. <laughs> you see, what she does is not going to determine how I am because I'm not given my responsibility over her to make me happy that lies with Christ. I'm going to share a life together. She's going to help me work on things. I'm going to help her work on things. But Christ is going to be the one that fixes it. Amen. We're going to share a life together. Paul has just recently returned from his first journey. He's established a church, like I said, and now receives a shocking message from the churches to which we now replies. I want you to look carefully in 1.6, the word deserting. He says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting God who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. You see, it implies that the complete transfer of allegiance from one thing to another it means to abandon a person, to abandon a cause, or to abandon an organization in a way considered disloyal or treacherous. They have abandoned the gospel message that Paul has given them. In the armed services, we call it what? Desertion or treason. It's punishable by imprisonment or death. When the Galatians turned their backs on Paul's authentic message, they were walking away from Jesus Christ Himself. They were deserting the gospel for a man-made gospel. Not only had they defected from the gospel, but they had done it, as verse 6 says, so quickly that it threw Paul for a loop. I kind of understand it a little bit because, remember, the law was in effect prior to the time had come when Jesus fulfilled all that, and now there's a new way that people no longer have to abide by the law to have an outward, what we call, sanctification. There was an inward now and the Holy Spirit resided within them as they accept Christ and there was now no works needed. But they were so close, close, they were trying to figure it out. The Judaizers were coming over and they were saying, no, yeah, you're saved, but you look, you need to be circumcised. You need to come to the temple. You need to wash seven times. Grace plus works. 
was what they were presenting. And Paul says, no, I know that. I did that all my life. I was a guy coming to your churches trying to destroy people and get them out of there because they were using a gospel message of grace. I was thinking that they were to be anathema. And I met Jesus on the road to Damascus and he straightened me out. Has Jesus straightened you out? <laughs> Has He showed you the love He's got for you? Do you really see what He has in store for you? Have you sat down long enough just to ask Him, Lord, what have you called me to do? You see, He's the only one that can tell you. I can't tell you. I can help equip you in your calling. I can help you work through what's going on. But your Lord speaks to you and He will tell you what He wants to do for you because I didn't prepare beforehand what you should do. He did. And you get to choose that. I want to see something as applied as an example of Galatians. I want you to look at the quick desertion of the Gospel. You see, it doesn't take many years in ministry to discover that one of the characteristics of a new Christian is what? Gullibility. Their heart is open Praise God He doesn't require that you know all this before you're saved. Because I don't know all of it now. I got asked a question this morning. I said, I don't know. Anime, don't do that to me again. <laughs> you make me look like a fool. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. But I am going to look it up and figure it out. Let me tell you. Second Samuel. <laughs> Go ask Jack. <laughs> That's what I was going to But anyway. Look, if you're involved in escorting a person to the family of God, please never forget how vulnerable that person can be from time to time until they become grounded in the truth. That's what we're doing today. I'm helping ground us in the truth, in the truth of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. It is by faith, through grace alone, and no works involved whatsoever. Does that mean you'll do nothing? Absolutely doesn't mean you'll do nothing. But your motivation is... For what He's done for you, your love is for Him now that you want to walk with Him. And your compassion in your heart wants to walk alongside and help those that are hurting, help those that don't know Christ because you want them to be, become a family member of God. Church, it's a love story. Do you get that? It's a love story. It's based on the precious love of Christ. It takes time for the faith to take root in your own person. As older, mature believers, y'all need, they need to help grow up the beautiful children that He's bringing up. Why, why do we have the precious children come down in the front? I want them to get used to coming down and hearing prayer and the call for the message of Christ. Because one day they're going to do it on their own. I want to be here for that. If the Lord wants me to be. They better hurry up because I'm pretty old. <laughs> If people who had been under Paul's ministry turned away so quickly from the gospel message, we should also be aware that it could happen to those that we lead to Christ too. So we need to be faithful to disciple them and walk alongside them. I want you to look again with me at verse 6. I'm amazed that you so quickly are deserting Him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. You see, this is just not another way of presenting the gospel. It is a false gospel that Paul's referring to. Paul described their man-made gospel with the Greek word heteros, which means another of a different kind. Nowhere near what the true message is. See, the Galatians considered this man-made works plus grace a brand of the gospel, a genuine choice. But it was absolutely nothing of the kind. By adding works of the law to the gospel of grace, the Judaizers had changed the very DNA of the gospel message. It was worthless. <coughs> worthless. If you think you can work your way to heaven, please let me know how many works you got to do because I want to be in that process. If that's the way it's going to be, give me the formula, will you? But I think you'll come find out real quick that the way to go is grace because you'll find out you'll labor every day, all day long, and you'll never get past confessing your sin. Jesus Christ died for your sin. Your sin has been covered you are not in sin anymore. You're removed and of sin. We have flesh and spirit that works within. But your position with Christ, that's who you are in Christ, is whole without blame. Now our practice, which is our walk, He's given us the grace sufficiently 
for us to complete that until we get into that final stage of glorification when we'll be side by side with Him. You have your position, you've got your practice, and we're going towards perfection. Justification, sanctification, glorification. Just don't worry about the glorification, okay? There's a lot of us that... <laughs> There's a, there's, a, there's a disorder in the manual of diagnostics and psychology and it's called the disorder of perfectionism. Can I tell you something? You are not perfect. But you will be perfect. But your position is made whole. But your practice is holy. W holy and H holy. God will work that out. You choose to follow Him. They changed the DNA. You see, their teaching was as different from the true gospel as night from day, from fire from water, and literally from death to life. The grace plus work guys were confusing the Galatians and they were distorting the gospel. Look at 1.7. It says, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Once they added something to simple faith, in Christ's person and work, whether it be circumcision, whether it be holy days, whether it be ceremonial cleansing, or whether it be observing the Sabbath day, they destroyed the gospel message. It's grace plus nothing. We all say that with me. Grace plus nothing. If I, I see you smile. I hammered that enough, honey. I'll back off. we got to get it right. It's a matter of life and death. So how did Paul respond to the truth-twisting false teaching wolves in sheep's clothing? I can tell you right now, he didn't schedule a conference with the church pastors and start a religious dialogue and let the Galatians weigh the merits on both sides. He didn't start a new process whereby to figure it out. No, he literally said this, he damned them to hell. Look what Paul does. Paul calls... Look, Paul calls down God's eternal judgment on those false teachers. It's amazing. But even if we, Paul includes himself, are an angel from heaven, got that covered too, if they should preach a gospel to you contrary to what we have preached to you, that person, he is to be accursed. So you see, Paul's message is so matter-of-fact that he even includes himself in the threatened curse along with heavenly angels in his circle of apostles. He included himself, and I include myself. If I preach you a false gospel, may I be damned to hell. That's how strong it is. Whether they're sent out in that word by himself or by missionary sending churches, nobody is off the hook. All are to be damned. The purity of the message takes priority over the status of the person. Did you hear me? The purity of the gospel message takes priority over the status of the person. It's a pure gospel message. You see, this phrasing makes the curse universal. If anyone were to preach a gospel different than what Paul and Barnabas preached, he would deserve to be anathema, which means totally annihilated and damned. He repeats the curse in the next verse. Look at 1 9. It's a double hit. As we have said before, so I say now again, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. He's to be anathema. Look, Paul's curse is not a slip of the tongue or a brief fit of rage. And his language does not fit under the category of vulgar cursing. Any more syllables and vowels in that word that are fit to vulgar cursing either. Paul isn't fiercely shaking his fist at his opponents and shouting, damn you, rather he's expressing a clear theological fact while under the respiration of God the Holy Spirit. He's letting them know they are to be annihilated, anathema, destroyed, as though they never existed. That's the curse of defying the gospel message. By the way, it's the curse of not receiving the gospel message too. You see, we were all born in sin. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the penalty of sin is death. We are to be a curse and anathema. But oh God in His glory sent His Son to earth. God in flesh. And God revealed His flesh in the man named Jesus. And Jesus walked perfectly on this earth and He climbed up on that cross and died for your sins and He died for my sins too. 
The penalty of your sin is gone. Do you hear that? So don't live in the curse of it. Don't let your past destroy your future. Don't let something you've done in your past override you in such a way that you feel guilt and shame and that you're not able to move forward. The blood of Christ has covered that. Move forward in the light of Christ. Don't let your past be a hindrance because it's not a hindrance to God. That's why He came is to take care of that for you. In the last verse we look at today, verse 10, Paul's comments about pleasing God appears up rather than men. This indicates that the grace plus work guys had likely accused Paul of trying to gain favor with the church members by teaching, by teaching freedom from the law. You guys don't have to do that law anymore. What did he do? He just unemployed the whole temple, didn't he? They all lost their jobs. You don't need this anymore. You just need the grace of Christ. It is sufficient for you. Look at verse 10. He defends himself and he says, For am I now seeking the favor of men? Or am I seeking the favor of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Are you a bondservant of Christ? If you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you are. You haven't been sold into slavery. You've been bought into slavery. He paid for you. 100%. It's all done. Except your status wasn't a slave anymore. Your status is to the highest of the rank. You've now become a child of the king. You've gone from a child of the devil to a child of the king. You've gone from an enemy of God to a friend of God. You've gone from a man-made gospel to a Christ-made gospel. That's the simple message of the gospel. We'll continue on as we see Paul then try to move forward and let them know that there's only one way and that's God's way. I praise God that Paul was met on the road to Damascus. But I praise God that the Holy Spirit can use people like Paul. Because I can compare myself to Paul a little bit and it's real simple because he takes the number one place. If you go to Timothy, and I'll close with this. If you go to Timothy, Paul says, and he has a great line of, of horrific things. There's those that kill their mothers. Wow. There's those that kill their fathers. And he goes on and on. And then Paul says, and among whom I am the chief sinner of all. So I want to give Paul the number one position. I'm going to take number two. Y'all can fight over number <laughs> but we don't need to fight because guess what all positions are annihilated when you become a child of the king I want you to walk in faith I want you to walk in a practice with your head up high get your head in heaven with Casey's, Casey Casey I'm going to lie you're too young for that guy. keep your feet on the ground and your head in whatever it is but I want you to keep your head in heaven and feet on the ground forget that just forget that will you? but anyway let's keep the gospel message in our heart I want, you, I want you to know that the gospel message is nothing to be ashamed of. Yes. It's something to be delivered. But church, deliver it in love. Let me tell you, it's rough enough to know that you're going to hell in a handbasket because you don't know Jesus. That's enough condemnation right there. You're delivering a message of love. That's what we're doing. Let's pray. Father, I thank You so much for Your beautiful Word. It's so clear. Father, may we maintain that and may we maintain it only because we're walking with You, being led by the Holy Spirit and also transforming into Christ. Father, I thank You for the offerings. Oh, Father, I pray for Rick. Father, Rick, I pray he's interviewing today for the, the church position. He's a fellow pastor. Oh, Father, I pray that You will guide him in a way, Father, if that's a place You want him, Father. May he go there and continue to preach the gospel message in a way that honors you. Father, we love you and thank you for your precious offerings. Father, because it's your touching the heart of these people that are giving. Father, thank you for the faithful and the loyalty of this beautiful, beautiful congregation that you have purchased with your blood. I pray all this in the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.